ערב טוב לכולם, good evening everyone, um, happy to host you here uh, today um, in, another, in another event of Maagarin. Um, we are, uh, to, tonight we are in the series on, uh, um, on ethics in academia, Midot Torot, Midot Torot Academia. And today with us, uh, Mr. Ariel Sabar um, and Professor Yitzhak Khen. And we'll talk with uh, the author, Ariel Sabar, about uh, his book, Veritas, um, um, a conversation about a bizarre academic scandal at, at no, not less than Harvard. Um, so thank you very much uh, all for joining us. Thank you very much, Itzik, to, for, for, for uh, doing this service. And of course, thank you very much, Ariel, for uh, joining us today. And Yitzhak, can you please uh, lead and maybe present uh, uh, Ariel? Well, yes, definitely. Uh, um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Ariel, for agreeing to, to join us. Um, and um, also, I'll just introduce you very briefly. Uh, Ariel Tzabar uh, is uh, um, an author and a journalist. He won the uh, National Book Critics Circles Award for his uh, first and fantastic book, uh, My Father's Paradise, about uh, uh, um, a travel with his father to the uh, a Kurdish village where they originated from, where he originated from. I really, I highly recommend it. it, it it's really a fantastic uh, um, a book about roots, about all sorts of questions about of uh, uh, Jewish descendants and, and so on and so forth. And But today we are going to talk with Ariel about uh, um, his recent book, uh, Veritas, Truth. A Harvard professor, a con man, and the gospel of Jesus' wife. Um, and to the Israelis of you, uh, you may have read a uh, review, a very uh, uh, good review I've written on this book in Haaretz. Um, but for those of you who do not know the, the story, I shall start by saying that it is it has to do with a forgery or, or allegedly a forgery. And it has to do with a very reputable and an excellent scholar, Karen King in Harvard. And um, my first question to Ariel actually is, what really attracted you to the gospel of Jesus' wife? Although I know what attracted me to, to look at it a long time ago when, it, when Karen King just published it. Uh, um, but, um, you are not a, a, a historian of Christianity. You are not coming from that academic field. So what really ticked it for you? Yeah, it's interesting. It was really um, you know, a story that fell into my lap. I, I had been a daily journalist for many years. I had, I had recently published um, uh, My Father's Paradise and I, I sort of left newspapers and I decided to um, start freelancing for magazines. and. Um, I had written a story, um, I'd written, I think, maybe one story for Smithsonian Magazine at that point. I had just turned in a story actually about scholars of Neo-Aramaic, my father's own dying mother tongue, allegedly the language of Jesus. Um, and there are these wonderful scholars who are crisscrossing the, the globe, um, especially in places like um, Detroit and Chicago, where there are large numbers of Aramaic-speaking Christians who once lived in you know, uh, the, you know, Turkey, Syria, uh, Iraq. Uh, and so I've written a story about these scholars knocking on doors, sort of a generation beneath my, fa my father, submitted it to Smithsonian. It had not been published yet. And one day in August of 2012, I got a phone call from like the number two editor at Smithsonian, who I'd never met before, never had any conversations with. And he said, and I, you know, when you get a call from someone that high up the masthead, your, your initial fear is, oh my gosh, they hated my, my story, they're killing it, they don't wanna work with me ever again. He's, you know, they're being polite about it. Um, but he, he said, no, 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 your, your story is still in the works, it's gonna be published soon, but we've got this other story that we'd love for you to jump on. Um, there is the, a very uh, distinguished Harvard professor named Karen King, who in three weeks will travel to Rome to announce the discovery of a manuscript that appears to be the first text from antiquity in which Jesus refers to 
uh, having to a what to having a wife essentially the the sort of um, headline making um, line on this tiny piece of papyrus it's about the size of a business card um, eight lines of Coptic um, and this the, the very center line says uh, says Jesus said to them my wife it's a fragmentary line so we don't know what comes before or after it and they said you know um, we would like you to go to Harvard to interview Karen King see the papyrus and then uh, travel to Rome um, when she announces this to the world, essentially. And you're right, I wasn't, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a scholar. I, you know, I'm, I'm a journalist. I, I think I'm a pretty quick study. I think I'm a good journalist. I think I can understand, you know, complicated academic ideas, not as well, of course, as academics do, but enough to explain, try to explain them with the help of academics to, to a lay public. Um, but on the other hand, I wasn't a, a, a journalist of, of religion. I, I, I'm Jewish. I hadn't had a lot of familiarity with the New Testament, and I had much less fam familiarity with texts that early Christian texts that did not make the New Testament, sort of the, the so-called Gnostic uh, texts or non-canonical texts. So I knew there'd be a very steep learning curve, and I only had three weeks to, you know, report the story, travel to Rome, interview King, see the papyrus, and you know, I'm a deadline journalist, but still, for a mag to write it, to write a fully formed magazine story in the course of three weeks on a subject that you're really uh, starting its uh, square one on, it was a challenge. So I think my first reaction is maybe I shouldn't do the story. You know, maybe I'm not the right journalist for it. On the other hand, um, I think I had some advice very early on from a, a really good editor who said, you know, I think he used a term, uh, maybe it, I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fake. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a, a he called, he said, uh, fo, fo, you should have, you should always be phobotropic as a journalist, which is that, if something makes you afraid, you should move towards it because that means you're about there's a there's a challenge involved. Um, the, 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 how great a challenge I, I wouldn't I wouldn't learn until quite a bit later. But it was really a story that was assigned to me, and I said, you know what? Sure, let it, it sounds like an absolutely astonishing story. Whatever this papyrus is, it's going to make headlines. It's going to it could potentially make history. Um, it it could be complete could be something completely different. But whatever it is, it's going to be. Uh, a big story. So that, that's how the story came to me in 2012. Well, thank you. Um, and then after meeting Karen King, uh, um, what was your impression when she talked to you about, about the, the so-called uh, uh, Jesus's uh, uh, wife? Because, you know, we are, well, I'm, I'm well aware of her studies. I was well aware of the fact that she is what we consider to be um, a fem feminist historian. She was arguing for female priesthood and, and for, for, she was taking her feminist views uh, um, sometimes out of Sudan. So for me, it was obvious that such a, a, a papyri will come from her side. Was it the same with you? Was it? Did you also notice in her reaction, in her uh, uh, um, exposure, when you talked to her before, and then at the Vatican, or, or not in the Vatican, at, at Rome, when she uh, presented it for the first time to academic audiences? Because it seems as if these two two, two meetings with her really uh, uh, set you on the route of looking for the forgery. Yeah, it was it was a process, but I mean, I, I will say that I go into every story open minded. I don't, I don't, I'm not a political journalist. I'm not an ideological journalist. I come in not having any assumptions other than it's my job to have an open mind and not prejudge anybody. I'm interested in people first and foremost. And so, yes, of course, in 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 trying to understand during those first interviews in 2012 at Harvard, I did. I wanted to understand what about her biography, what about her approach to history, um, what her what about her her very. It's not a, it's not like a crypt cryptic project. She's very open about um, this, you know, uh, seeking to recover the lost voices of women in Christianity, which is which, around which there's really wonderful scholarship um, that has examined the ways in which um, female figures have been marginalized. Mary Magdalene has been falsely slandered as, as a prostitute, when in fact, there's nothing at all um, about her being a prostitute in the New Testament or any, in any Christian text. It was an invention of later popes who conflated Mary with other female figures in, in, the, in the Gospels. And so she's very public about what, what she has attempted to do uh, in her study of Christianity. And, um, you know, I think uh, I, I was aware of that. And she, it's, again, it wasn't something that was a secret. Um, 
Uh, but I think I think she, you know, it, it does raise, you know, and so I, I was interested in understanding how how this latest discovery um, fit with her prior scholarship, and um, and I think you know you could hear in the way she spoke about it the the way in which it would help um, uh, fuel the conversation that I think she wanted um, not only academics but believers to have. Um, I mean, she is herself. Um, you know, there will be a lot of people out there who say, oh, of course, you know. Godless Harvard has found this 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 scrap of papyrus because they're trying to destroy the Catholic Church. Um, I don't think that's the case. Karen, Karen King is a, a, a progressive, um, believing Christian who wants to make who wants to sort of make the remake the faith in a way that's more perhaps inclusive, in a way that that takes these these um, these gospels that did not sort of get the early bishop's seal of approval, did not make it into the New Testament, and say, look, there are these. Early Christianity was a place where there were a lot of different voices. Yes, there were the voices we're familiar with from, from the Bible, if you're Christian, that you open in, in church and read from. But there are all these other Gospels, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas, that sort of didn't make the cut. And let's let's just see what those Gospels tell us about early Christianity. And and I think, of course, that, you know, she... Uh, there is a, the sense in which you want to call it feminist, um, if you like, um, in which she was trying to bring, uh, shine a spy lot, spot, spotlight on, on, on women who were excluded. And so I think this papyrus, what it did was it took, in a way, it, it, it took, it built on the scholarship she had, she had already done, but it had this sort of um, sensational twist. It was sort of, uh, the, it's too, maybe too complicated to go into this, 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 this call, but Karen King, I think, had always lamented. She was, she was very, she had always focused on the ways in which these, these forgotten texts of Christianity excluded women like Mary Magdalene, who actually had leadership roles, who were close confidants of Jesus. But she had always lamented the fact that every time one of these women appeared in these early gospels, they were desexualized. They, they, they're, even though they were women, they were, they were clearly female characters, they were stripped of their femininity, their, 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 their sort of sexuality um, in, in various ways. And she lamented that. Why is it that every time a woman has to be a leader, in early Christianity, um, we need to we need to make her essentially sexless, and that was something she had lamented for a long time. And here, in this in this in eight lines of fragmentary Coptic, um, that that contradiction is resolved for the first time for her because the famous line is um, Jesus said to them, "My wife." So here's a, a physical woman who is part of Jesus's wife. The next line is she is able to be my disciple. So it, it, it absolutely, it, it, I mean, the, the brilliance and the economy of the forgery is, is absolutely stunning because it's eight fragmentary lines of Coptic. It, it's like this big and, and right in the center, like as if on a billboard are the first ever portrayal of a, a sort of a wife of Jesus who was also um, one of his close disciples. So clearly this took what she, she had spent a career um, working towards and sort of, uh, sort of turbocharged it, if you will. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. Well, don't get me wrong. I think she's a brilliant scholar. She she has yeah. done some fantastic work. I think that in this case, she she was um, a bit naive because the, the, it was you know a, a, a wishful thinking, uh, 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 and uh, um, she she became a victim of, of, of a scammer who who actually uh, um, was extremely. Uh, uh, sophisticated and brilliant, and 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 uh, I think that in the book you're really uh, um, outlining the the complexities of of uh, of doing this forgery, of actually producing this forgery, the amount of knowledge that went into it, and not only the knowledge of the languages or, or, of Coptic and 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 producing papyri or or, or, or you know forging a, a, a papyri, but also to, to look at the, uh, the contextual academic uh, 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 circles that will accept it. And I think in, in that respect, the, uh, um, the hero of this book is not Karen King and, and definitely not the, uh, uh, the, uh, the small papyri, but the, the, uh, um, the villain it's himself, the, 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 the scammer. And, and uh, what was I was waiting to hear as why, why he did it. But of course, uh, there's no clear answer for that unless he'll come forward and, and tell us. Maybe maybe now if he's joining us to this uh, uh, 
um, um, Zoom meeting. Um, so uh, I, I do think that in, in that respect, and, and I said so in my uh, um, in my review, it is the book is written like a, a like a detective story, and it is you know there there are it, it is clear that it is uh, uh, divided into five acts of, of, of how to work through it. And so I was, I was wanting to ask you whether you, you were immediately from the beginning, so it, you know, falling uh, uh, out for you or just, you know, you followed it and then, you know, revealing bit by bit, of course, you didn't know at the beginning what you knew mm -hmm. later on, but uh, did you see it from the, from the beginning as, 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 a, um, as a story that is taking you to a certain point or, or was it, you know, just a, a, a work of a journalist? Because we historians, we, know, we, we tend to think that we are coming to our sources unbiased and, and without mm -hmm. any presumptions and looking and reading the sources and then telling you what, you, what, uh, uh, um, what we learn from them. But yeah. in most cases, we definitely knows part of the answer when we approach our texts sure. so uh um i would like to hear it from you because you're I mean, if you're asking different discipline if you're writing if you're asking kind of like a, a, a writer a writer's craft question yes i mean absolutely um i wanted this to read uh like a detective story um and because that's in many ways the way i i experienced it i mean in some cases you might know the answer at the beginning, like an event that unfolded 50 years ago, we sort of know the ending. And so the historian is sort of artificially um, creating a detective story and that, or, the, or the journalist. And there's nothing wrong with that. It makes really compelling reading and it, it opens up uh, complex um, historical episodes to a much wider audience sometimes than, than scholars reach unless they write in a very accessible way. Um, but, I, but the interesting thing in this case is that I, I not only wrote it, I mean, I not only wrote it like a detective story, but I experienced it as one because I was there at the very beginning. I was one of the first journalists who had access to Karen King, not knowing at all at the beginning where it would lead, knowing of course that Karen King was the holder of um, the Hollis Professorship of Divinity. It's the oldest endowed professorship in any subject in all of North America. It was established before the Declaration of Independence. Um, she had really, you know, she had risen her, uh, all the way to the top of a ma the male dominated field of, of biblical study. She was. I don't think Smithsonian Magazine would have done the story if she weren't from Harvard. I mean, that was what made it. Um, so, so I came in sort of open-minded, but also, you know, a skeptical, partly because it's our job as a journalist to always be skeptical. You're open-minded, but you always have to, you never want to take uh, anything anybody tells you at, at face value. I mean, there's, there's a, a joke that journalists sometimes tell that, you know, if, if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. So, I mean, there, there's a sense that we, everything we're, you know, we have to vet uh, what, what we do. And so even though this was coming from Harvard, I did ask a lot of questions early on about provenance. I wanted to know who was this individual who, who and this, this is sort of where the mystery starts to compound right at the beginning, and, and which you'll see reflected in the book. Who was this anonymous individual who approached one of the most distinguished scholars um, uh, of, of non-canonical texts in early Christianity and, and managed to convince her to take, take it public. And, and she said, I, I can't tell you. Um, he asked for confidence, he asked for anonymity and I'm going to respect that. I, you know, it's not uncommon, collectors want to remain anonymous. And, and it's true, it's not uncommon that collectors want to remain anonymous. On the other hand, when the stakes are this high um, and in a field that has been victimized by forgeries and looted artifacts in the past, like provenance matters in, 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 in ways that it might not um, in, 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 for other objects. I and mean, some people would say provenance always matters and I, I agree with them. Um, and, and then she, I said, you know, I said, look, I, okay, so you can't tell me who he is, but is this someone like, is this an individual you knew pro previously? Is this, a, is this someone like a, a Martin Schoen or a very prominent collector whose name were it to be disclosed would sort of ring, ring a bell with, 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 act with scholars or, or, or prominent manuscript collectors. And she said, nope, not at all. Uh, he was, a, he was a, I'll never forget this. She said, he was a complete stranger. He was a, someone she'd never heard of before who emailed her one day out of the blue saying, I have, a, I have a collection of Coptic papyri. I have one that appears to depict a conversation between Jesus and his disciples over somebody named Mary. So he's like, he knows exactly what buttons to push. 
Uh, I, but I can't read it. I don't read Coptic, so I don't know what it says. Um, would you be willing to take a look at it? And so um, for a very long period of time until I returned to the story in 2016 to investigate its provenance for the Atlantic magazine, no one knew who this individual was. And scholars want asked the question, journalists asked the question, but every time the response from Karen King was, um, I'm not going to tell you, I can't tell you. And, and that mystery for me was there right, you asked what was there from the start? It was the mystery of who was the anonymous collector who brought Karen King this sensational papyrus, which was, was so history making um, or appeared to be that it made the front page of the New York Times and the Boston Globe the day after it was announced. So this was something that, that, that had the potential to rework uh, uh, one's understanding of early Christianity, but also was seen as, as a potential challenge to, um, to pillars of Catholic tradition. One is that Jesus was a celibate bachelor. Um, the other is that Jesus admitted no women to his closest circle. And so um, it, it had the, it really packed a lot of firepower, yet the individual who made you know, the, the bomb, so to speak, uh, was, was anonymous. And that for me was the, the mystery that compelled me to return to the story and eventually write the book. Good. Um, I should just mention that I've read in your Twitter account that uh, uh, they're selling replicas of, of, of the of the papyrus now. They from are, Florida, yes, they are. And, <laughs> and they're they're emanating from the same part of Florida. Of course, everything strange in America comes comes out of Florida. Um, that in which the uh, the forger, um, the, the alleged forger, I should say, the alleged forger lives. So Florida, I don't think it's. I don't think. The, the alleged forger is manufacturing the replicas. That's it's a, it's a place that also manufactures like, um, you know, Indiana Jones memorabilia. But the, <laughs> but you can actually you can actually buy a, a replica of the Gospel of Jesus' Wife. Um, and it's funny because it's ever it's, it's being sold on eBay for something like forty nine dollars. But it's like you know with a with a booklet, a certificate, and and signature. And I'm thinking like, whose signature? Like, <laughs> I mean, it was Jesus. just it's just and, it's just, and, and, Signed, it's signed. So I don't know who signed it, but I, I just think it gets at how, how it's already, it's kind of entered the, the popular culture and the way in which it's, it's, it continues um, to resonate. It's, it's, it's just a bizarre, and of course it comes from, from Florida. It just has to. <laughs> yeah. Good. David, would you like to, to uh, uh, join in? Uh, I'd like to, if, if, you, if possible, because you, you are so knowledgeable in the, with the story. No, 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 no. please, I'm please first. do. So uh, I'd like to take you to the uh, parts where uh, reception by the academic uh, world, uh, including journals, uh, are how they deal with us uh, issues. Um, so there is a publication, mm. and then um, and then what? Yeah. So well, the first there wasn't a publication. So this I think this is might be really interesting, particularly for this audience. So Karen King, a month like a month before she announced her discovery in Rome, had submitted um, her article um, uh, on the Gospel of Jesus's Wife to the to Harvard Theological Review. Um, and how, how, you, you tell me how to pronounce this. Is it Editio Principes? It's, it's a lot. It's a lot word. Right? How do you pronounce it? I did your principles, but, but that's you. fine. I'm not even <laughs> so um, that was so she submitted that um, to the Harvard Theological Review, but it wasn't just the first reading of the papyrus for publication. It was also a very in-depth and, and brilliant um, analysis, an interpretation. I mean, I, I should say very clearly that Karen King is probably best known. Not not. I mean, yes, she's she is a historian by training, but she is a sort of brilliant interpreter of cryptic fragmentary text. So she's very good at connecting the dots in texts that are missing many of their pages, and in fact, many parts of, the, of individual lines. So there's an act of both interpretation, but also creativity in, involved there. And I think it, it's no accident for in, 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 that the forger um, submitted to Karen King a text that had gaps because it allowed her to fill in the blanks. And, and, and there's no one who fills in blanks um, better than, than Karen King when you're talking about early Christianity. And I say that uh, in, in a way that, in, in a praiseworthy way. I mean, she really is able to see what, it, what plausibly might plausibly be missing, but it also makes her, I think, an attract, could make her an attractive target for a forger who, who knows, who will not, who, who um, will not push, but will lead, who will say, 
here's the, here it will lead it will sort of lead somebody to water and, and let them drink. Um, so Karen King submitted her article to the to the Harvard Theological Review, um, and um, the Harvard Theological Review is one of the most esteemed publications in in, in theology. Uh, it's been around for more than a hundred years. Um, however, it is published and although it's technically published by Cambridge University Press, all of its editors are Harvard Divinity School scholars. So it's edited by her own, her own colleagues uh, at, at the Divinity School. And the Harvard Theological Review sent her article and images of the papyrus to, to three scholars uh, for peer review. Um, two of the scholars, um, and these are two scholars, I discovered it was all double blind and anonymous, but I discovered and, and interviewed on the record all of the scholars uh, for, for the book. Um, but two of the scholars would wind up being like the very top people in Coptic language, uh, early Christian Coptic language, um, who had literally written like textbooks on the subject. You Bentley, Bentley Layton at, at Yale and um, Stephen Emmel, uh, uh, who is uh, in Germany. Um, and so these were two scholars who looked at the papyrus and wrote the Harvard Theological Review like, you should not publish this. You are, you are in grave danger of em embar gravely embarrassing yourselves this looks very much like a forgery for like a lot of different reasons, um, including the fact that on, on, a, on a papyrus um, the size of a business card, there, there were no fewer than four basic violations of, of Coptic grammar. There were, there were spelling errors. Um, it was bad Coptic. I mean, it was Coptic and there, aren't, there weren't previously known Coptic forger. Coptic is an obscure, it's, the, you know, it's a relatively obscure language. There are forgeries in Greek, Coptic, it, you know, it, it, so it, the, it, there were a lot of problems identified right away. And so two out of the three peer reviewers that uh, Harvard Theological Review consulted said, ha expressed grave concerns about the authenticity of the papyrus. The third peer reviewer and the only one to, to give it a positive review, and this is something I only discovered and was only discovered because of my book, um, was the only, was a scholar who had been deeply involved in drafting the article that the person was being asked to review. And in fact, so this is Roger Bagnall at, at, um, at, at NYU, who's the head of the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World, very distinguished papyrologist, um, but who wrote that, who actually wrote back to the Harvard Theological Review and said, you should not be asking me to peer review this. I helped Karen King draft the article. I've already sat down for a Smithsonian Channel documentary. This wasn't me, it was the TV part of the Smithsonian. Um, and told them, I believe this is authentic. I've already formed an, op an opinion and I've expressed it publicly. Plus I was involved in writing the article you're asking me to review. I should not be asked to do this. If you want me to write you a few lines about it, I will, but you should know that you sh I should not be used as a traditional peer reviewer. So the Harvard Theological Review um, gets these few reviews back. And, and actually once Karen King announces in Rome, there's so much of a pushback at the annual, it's actually the quadrennial um, conference of Coptic studies, so many scholars in the room, when she presents, they have expre expressed really uh, serious misgivings about it, that um, combined with the two negative peer reviews, Harvard Theological Review puts the brakes on publication. They say, you know, we, we haven't done all our homework here. You need, you know, you didn't even, we didn't even do scientific testing on a papyrus, which is just unheard of these days. Like if you're, if you're gonna go public with, with, with like the gospel of Judas, for instance, which was about five years before, that's an authentic and non-canonical papyrus, tells a different story about Judas, the alleged traitor, uh, Jesus's, you know, turncoat, um, tells a very different story. It was, it was vetted by an extremely, you know, distinguished group of scholars and then underwent extensive scientific testing before, before it was announced. In this case, Karen King skipped all that. She went straight from, I get this from a collector, I show it to uh, one, one, papyr, one distinguished papyrologist and, and we go public. And so after the, the backlash in Rome, HTR, Harvard Theological Review stopped, stopped and said, you need to do some testing. We need to consult with other scholars before we go public. And then for about a year and a half, there's like nothing. Everything goes dark. All the scientific tests that were supposed to be announced within the next two or three months, didn't, there was no announcement. People were thinking, you know, maybe the test brought up problematic findings. Maybe Karen King is slowly walking away from this. I'm totally understandable. It didn't turn out to be what she thought it was. Um, and she will let it sort of die a quiet death, um, which would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, but then um, 
in April of 2014, Harvard Theological, about a year and a half, more than a year and a half after Karen King's announcement, boom, there's the there's Karen King's article in the Harvard Theological Review. And, and it took a lot of people by surprise. Again, it got extensive coverage in the Boston Globe and New York Times. Um, and um, the scientists she had consulted had found no evidence of modern forgery. Um, and um, they did a carbon-14 dating test, um, which they also touted initially to the, to the press as evidence that it was that it was an ancient papyrus. Um, the problem was that the the dating, the carbon-14 dating, um, dated it to the um, early Middle Ages, which which was completely off sync with Karen King's timeline of when this this would have been produced. She had, she had proposed that it was a second century text copied in the fourth century, and the carbon-14 uh, test placed um, the uh, the papyrus in, basically would have placed the, the papyrus in like early Islamic Egypt. Now I have to be careful because Yitzhak's a, a, an expert, I think, in this era, because I'm going to inevitably screw this up. But, um, you know, to, to, to find a sort of a, a so quote unquote heretical Christian gospel circulating in early Islamic Egypt at the time in which um, Christianity in Egypt had become fully orthodox would require quite a bit of historical explanation. It doesn't on its face make a whole lot of sense. And so it really flew in the face of Karen King's initial interpretation. Yet in the press release, it was like carbon-14 dating discovers, you know, a papyrus is ancient. Um, um, but, um, and so none of this sort of explained away the possibility which was proposed right from the start, which is that the papyrus, the papyrus itself was ancient material. No one ever disputed that. Um, it happened to be medieval papyrus on which a modern forger appears to have um, inscribed a, a completely invented modern text. Um, so you have this publication, finally, you have distinguished scientists from MIT and Columbia who appear to find no evidence of, of forgery. Um, and the, it seems like, you know, a story about the vindication of a scholar who had been, you know, falsely accused of, uh, of cutting corners and it turned out she was, it looked, looked like she was right. And um, however, this brief sort of period of, of, of um, uh, redemption, um, was, well, it was brief. Uh, within about um, another two weeks, uh, a, a, a very a, a young and up and coming promising scholar, Coptic, um, noticed something bizarre about another text in the same collector's that the same collector had given Karen King, a fragment of the Gospel of John. Now, Karen King had had this other papyrus from the same collector pretty much the whole time, but she'd never released photos of it. Photos of it emerged in a publication of one of the scientists who did ink testing. He just said, you know, here's here are the places from this Gospel of John fragment where I took samples. And um, the this young Coptic scholar looked at that. He'd written his PhD thesis on Coptic editions of the Gospel of John. And he noticed that every single line of this, this Coptic Gospel of John shared a line ending or line beginning with the only uh, extant uh, or the earliest Coptic copy of the Gospel of John. And it's one that's freely available online. And, 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 and that was, was a main, because line breaks, it's not like you have Microsoft Word where you like force justify stuff. In antiquity, um, it's about in early antiquity, you would not find like lines matching, line after line after line after line. Um, and so that became like, if you, you already have doubts about the gospel of Jesus' wife, and now you have another forgery that the same guy, that another text that the same individual gave Karen King, and it's like an out and out forgery. I mean, it made Karen King like really, I think for the first time, go like, oh my goodness, what, what's going on here? Um, and then what also wound up happening um, was that, these are discoveries I made in the course of investigative reporting for my book, is that while Columbia and MIT are of course wonderful, you know, top tier institutions, and while both of the scientists involved are top tier scientists, um, neither of them had ever before worked with an archeological object. Neither of them had ever tested papyri before. And so, it raised the question of like, how did these two scientists, of all people, of all the people you could ask, and they're experts in uh, archeometry, which is the scientific study of archeological objects who are out there, who, who do this kind of work, why weren't they asked? It was, it was fascinating that they, the, the experts in, in archeological science weren't asked to look at this, but these other scientists who did other things unrelated to archeological science were asked. And so uh, one of the things I discovered was that the, the scientists at Columbia was the brother-in-law of Roger Bagnall, the only other prominent scholar to have staked his reputation on the authenticity of the papyrus. 
Um, and the, the scientist at MIT, um, another very distinguished Lemuel, Lemuel Sin Award winning scientist um, at, at MIT, uh, who's an expert in modern explosives detection. You know, not, it's not ancient history, not archaeological office. How did he get picked? Well, it turns out I was looking through uh, uh, like digitized newspapers from Karen King's hometown in small town Montana, where she grew up. I was just trying to understand the era in which she grew up and the community. And I noticed that in the wedding announcement for her first marriage, um, one of the ushers is listed as Tim Swager. I'm like, that's weird. That There's a Tim Swager who did these tests at MIT. And it turns out they're the same individual. So um, Karen King had, at, the, the, had this, into this, this scientist had been asked to, to, to do some testing on the pirate, papyrus, uh, the gospel of Jesus' wife was a close, not only the usher at her wedding, but was a close family friend since her childhood. And none of these details, none of these close personal relationships of these two major scientists who, who, uh, who posited these um, authenticating tests uh, that their, their, their personal ties to Karen King and Roger Bagnall were never publicly disclosed. They weren't disclosed to the public, they weren't disclosed to the media, and they weren't even disclosed to the editors of the Harvard Theological Review um, in, in, in clear violation of Cambridge University Press's um, uh, conflict of in interest policy. And so that was another discovery of a way in which after her own colleagues and peer reviewers very early on said, stop, let, you know, peer review is there to prevent all of us because all of us sometimes get too enthusiastic about our subjects. In, in my profession, we have fact checkers and we have editors who say, wait a second, Sabar, you've gone too far here. You know, you need to rewrite this sentence or we need to take this out of the story. It's not a fact. In, in academia, as you all know, peer reviewers often perform that same function. And here you have peer reviewers saying, stop, you had scientific tests that weren't done beforehand. And then it turns out the scientists you, you, you recruit to salvage the papyrus have these serious undisclosed conflicts of interest. And so um, all of that deepened the mystery for me uh, and complicated it as I was, as I was writing very fast. Uh, Yitzhak, do you want to go on? Um, yeah, um, I think we should open the floor if someone else has questions to uh, Ariel. Um, well, I can go on and asking questions and discussing this stuff with him for hours. But uh, uh, um, I think that if someone else would like to 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 jump in and ask a question, uh, um, that's the time. If not, I'll go on. Is it possible to have a compliment break? This, I just want to say it's fascinating and the work you did with this is amazing. I've only known about this subject from the invitation to this talk and I'm going to look for the book. It's oh, thank you. really, thank you very much. I'm amazed. Thank you, Adal. Thank you. Yeah. I also, I have, have, a que I also have a question, but I, I think I, uh, others should go first. So please. Um, so here's so, something in the chat. Someone says, what have been the reactions to your book? Is it true that Harvard and Dr. King have not disavowed her findings? Well, yeah, it's, so it's complex. So in the wake of my Atlantic Magazine story in 2016, which was the sort of pre precursor of the book, um, the Karen King, this was the other interesting thing. So I had, I had through investigative reporting um, and a bit at a long cat and mouse game, which is... Um, which I write about in the book, I had identified the owner of the papyrus and likely forger. Um, I should say, in the interest of fairness, that he denies forging the papyrus, but every scholar who's, who has studied the issue feels with a high degree of certainty that he did. We also know that he is, that because of other documents that he submitted to the state of Florida, including a, a faked uh, Egyptology degree, that he either is a forger or he works closely with forgers, so that's undeniable. But anyway, um, the uh, so after my Atlantic story identifying this individual and his fascinating background, um, he, uh, among other things, uh, aside from the fact that he washed, he, he washed out of an Egyptology program at, uh, at the Free University in Berlin uh, after having a conflict with a, a professor who accused him of plagiarizing his ideas. Um, he also has another interesting part of his his, his background, which I discovered, which is that he is an, uh, uh, was a very successful, he and his wife were very successful internet pornographers um, who participated in a genre of porn known as, of, of all things, as hot wife, in which the figure of the wife was sort of deified um, and, and celebrated 
in a modern context in, in, in pornography. Um, but here's a gentleman who studied Coptic, apparently wasn't very good at Coptic, who when he wasn't forging, allegedly forging Coptic texts, he was making movies of his, his wife, um, uh, you know, having relations with other men. And then, um, and, and, and his wife, I should also say, um, when she's not being filmed uh, for these porn movies, again, for very successful, she was like the number five ranked hot wife in all the world, according to one blog. She was also writing um, books under her own name in which she claimed to channel um, the voices of angels and of, and of God. So here, here are two people really fat. I mean, I, again, I'm just interested in, in the psychology of how, how it is that, that, that people come to be, to have certain obsessions. So here's a couple who had really interesting discussions and a really interesting personal life at the intersection of sexuality and faith. Um, and, and, and in a way, in a mirroring, in a very, you know, you have a high culture, low culture, Harvard, of course, Karen King at Harvard having these very intellectual discussions about the intersection of, of faith and sexuality. And then you have Walter Fritz and his wife, Walter Fritz is the alleged forger, and his wife who are making porn movies about sexuality and faith and in, in a way. Um, and so anyway, after that, after that story came out uh, in the Atlantic to answer a very long way of answering your question, Karen King uh, called, me up, uh, called me up and said, I now believe that Papyrus is likely a forger. Um, and it was, it was major news. Her, her, her 180 degree turn on, on the question of authenticity was covered on the front page of the Boston Globe. They, Harvard posted a, briefly posted an announcement on their, on their Gospel of Jesus' Wife website saying Karen King has now said she believes it's a, it's a forgery. However, and this is where, where your question is really relevant, is um, Harvard Theological Review has yet to issue a retraction of her article. And that, and I wrote, I, if you're interested in going into the weeds on that, um, I wrote an article for the Chronicle of Education this past June um, that, that, that tries to answer the question of why Harvard Theological Review, after Karen King herself has disavowed the papyrus, after Harvard Theological Review itself um, had initially said, we won't publish this thing unless we think it's authentic, how it is that after publication, um, when the there's not a single scholar um, that I'm aware of who will publicly defend the gospel of Jesus' wife as authentic, um, when the, when despite conflicts of interest among scientists that, that were clear violations of, uh, in my view anyway, of the, uh, of the uh, Cambridge University Press ethics policy, why is it that, um, what is it now, uh, six years after publication, Harvard Theological Review has yet to retract the article. And that's a really I don't want to get too into the weeds on that, but I, I, uh, if you look up R.L. Sabar and Chronicle of Higher Education, um, you'll find the article I wrote that tries to answer the question. And I think a lot of it comes to, and I think this, this is really, this may be helpful to your audience, is this question of insularity. When you find that you're only asking your friends for reactions to something brilliant you, you feel you've produced, it's dangerous. It's not to say that, it, 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 you know, you should ask, you should ask trusted colleagues to look at your work. But if, if the only people who you approach are people who already agree with you, you're at risk of publishing something that, that has not been properly vetted. And, that, and I think in this case, you had a, you had, the Harvard Theological Review became complicit in a way um, when it decided to go ahead without understanding who these scientists were and without trusting their initial judgments, which was that there's something really off about this papyrus. And however, once they were involved, it was very, very hard for them to step away because these are all uh, these are these are all people within the same department at Harvard. I mean, this wasn't another journal outside Harvard. It was the Harvard Theological Review. It has the Harvard name on it. It's edited by Karen King's own colleagues, people who have to say hello to her uh, in the hall every day. And so it's very very hard. I, I know academia academics can you know you hate the guy across or the gal across the hall. It can be you can have fights even with people within your own department. But there's also a sense of, of, of institutional preservation. Once someone, once you already have a stake in, in, a, in, a, in a piece of scholarship that's a con job in this case, it's very, very hard to publicly disavow that because publicly disavowing it involves burning bridges with a whole lot of people you have to see every day. And so if you can't like ghost somebody if you see them at department meetings, it's just not. So I think, I think, I think in many ways, the, one of the larger lessons, just if I can speak, I mean, just as a lay, journalist who has a father who's a scholar and who, who reveres what scholars do is the one trap that I think I think this illustrates is in the trap of insularity. When you when the people outside, the people who don't have a stake are saying don't publish. And the only people who, who do 
who, who, who say publish are those who have a deep stake and who work in your, in your department, then you may have a problem and you may want to go to a broader group of scholars, even people who you know are going to give you a hard time um, because you may there may be some insights to be gained from people who act actively dislike you or actively dislike your work, for, as, as painful as that can be sometimes. So um, Harvard Theological Review, and I do think this is an issue, and I think it's a very important point. Why have they not retracted this article? And they have a bunch of what I believe are um, not completely convincing explanations. Although, I, although it is, I should say, it, Cambridge University Press is actively investigating. Since my book came out, there's an ongoing investigation of what, what went wrong. But it will, be, it will be ultimately up to Harvard Theological Review because they have editorial independence to decide whether to retract the article. So once again, you have Harvard professors um, acting as a ju judge and jury in their own case. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a tricky um, structural problem in that way. But there is a question here from uh, Jennifer Davis. Um, could you say something about the research you did on the forger and his possible child abuse? Yeah, so I mean, it's motivation is always tricky. Like what, what is it that motivates someone to do anything? Oftentimes we don't know what motivates us to do something. Um, so I did try, you know, Walter Fritz, absolutely fascinating individual. So he's making, you know, this kind of se sex, you know, this, this, this porn that deifies his wife. Um, he, uh, he, he, he sort of washed out of an Egyptology program. So maybe he has a grudge against academia. He wants to, he wants to show up the experts, which is a, a very common um, a motivation for forgers who think that, you know, who hate the idea that, the academia rejected them and they're going to show everybody up. Um, there's also the question of his personal finances. They were suffering at the time he approached Karen King. He was trying to sell his house. Uh, it was right after the 2009 recession, which hit Florida particularly hard. But then there was this other element, which, which, the, which Jen, uh, Jennifer Davis raises, which is um, Walter Fritz claimed to have been um, sexually abused by a Catholic priest in a conservative small town in, 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 in Southern Germany when he was a boy. Um, and, um, and so here, you know, and, and clearly um, someone who felt as he did that the Catholic priest ruined his life and that um, would have an incentive to want to, um, you know, um, raise questions about how solid this, this Catholic notion of a celibate Jesus was. Um, and, uh, and he in fact told me during one of our conversations that if Jesus were married, then, you know, priests, uh, and then, then priests could be married and they wouldn't have to abuse children. Um, and, you know, but, but as, you know, I also knew that I was, I was dealing with a forger and, a, and, a, and someone who had lied to me and to Karen King repeatedly. So I did, um, to the best of my ability, try to vet that story. Um, I went to the, the town um, where he grew up. Um, he, all of his descriptions, I mean, he gave me these descriptions that, that, that looked like they were right out of the Da Vinci Code, that he lived on, um, you know, a, a road called God's Mountain Road down, down the hill from a, uh, a, semi, a, 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 um, a monastery that had um, the blood of Jesus that celebrated the blood of Jesus. I'm like, come on, this is totally Da Vinci Code, right? Um, and but when I actually went and checked, um, all the we, I went with an interpreter, a, a German journalist who helped me negotiate the language and other things. We looked, we got the, uh, the the historical records of the town. Walter Fritz and his mother, his single mother, um, lived for a time on Gotha's uh, Mountain Road um, down the hill from. Um, a, a chapel that celebrated the blood of Jesus. Um, and in fact, there was this priest um, who, who, although there weren't any other boys that I, from Walter Fritz's era that claimed that they were, they were sexually molested, he had made a number of them physically uncomfortable by getting too close to them in various ways. We also were able to, to validate that Walter Fritz did file a complaint. It was interesting, about three months before he, he gave, or five months before he gave the gospel of Jesus' wife to Karen King, he wrote a letter to Pope Benedict, which I initially thought was um, maybe he was just feeding to me because he thought it would, um, it would impress me in some way, whether it's, uh, you know, whether he, the abuse had happened or not, he did actually write the letter to the church. The Vatican confirmed that the letters that uh, he had written and that some Vatican officials had wrote, written back to him were authentic. So he was someone who claimed and had, and was taken seriously as having been victimized by a Catholic priest uh, in a small conservative Catholic town in which his mother was a divorced woman raising two kids. And in that era, in conservative small town Germany, Walter Fritz set us up. You were, the townspeople regarded her as a whore. That was the term he used. And so here again, we see sort of the parallel with Mary Magdalene, falsely slandered um, as a whore, even though she was just 
an independent, strong woman. And it's really interesting the ways in which like the, these, these biographical details um, intertwined with Walter Fritz's, uh, with, with the gospel of Jesus's way. And so I ultimately, I present the evidence of, um, of, of, of what we know about whether these abuse claims are, are, um, are to be believed. I, I don't, I, 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 my own personal feeling is that they're more likely to be true than not true. Um, but we also have to remember that Walter Fritz is, is a liar. Um, and so um, we, readers should take all of that into account when we encounter that in the book. I see another question from uh, Dr. Kimby. Um, what led you to yeah. suggest that you Hi, how are you? <laughs> hi, hi. No, you know, it's like for me, when you get down to the end of the book and you kind of suggest that it was a, like a, an internal power struggle at Harvard, sort of really creating a religion department to kind of compete with the Harvard Divinity School. Yes. And I wondered what led you to offer that. Because Karen King, as I say in my question, it just seemed like she held on to this view so much longer than any reasonable person would. So yeah. the idea that, oh, maybe there's something really big at stake here. Well, that that is something I, I at the end of the book, I don't want to, it's a bit, I don't, it's, I don't want it to be a spoiler for too many readers, but you're right. There is a way in which um, this dispute, uh, aspects of the dispute go all the way up to the Harvard president's office. Uh, I'd love people to read the book to, to, to figure out why. But there was a larger, at, at the time, at, at the time that the, that the forger, the alleged forger approached Karen King, um, the Harvard president had begun um, a review, uh, like a top to bottom review of the study of religion at Harvard. Um, because there, were, there was a sense among both scholars and, um, uh, and, and at the administrative level that Harvard was underperforming. Uh, Harvard likes to overperform in every discipline but that religion somehow it wasn't quite living up to its potential. And there, were, there was a suggestion that maybe a freestanding department of religious studies should be created on the Harvard Yard. Harvard is, 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 is I think, unique among um, top tier American universities in that there is no freestanding department, secular department of religious studies on the main campus. The Divinity School is the center of religious uh, inquiry at Harvard. Um, and so while there are, there, and then there's this cumbersome, very odd bureaucratic structure called like the Committee on the Study of Religion at Harvard that includes scholars from the yard, from the main part of Harvard. But Harvard, the center of gravity for the study of religion is at a school, it's non-denominational, but it's a school that is, is both um, minting PhDs and training ministers. And so for a lot of scholars, like that's weird. Like the whole reason that religious studies was created as a discipline was to disentangle the theological part of our work from the secular part of our work as historians, as anthropologists, as, as cultural um, people engaged in various kinds of cultural studies. We, we wanna take God out of it. Um, and yet at the divinity school, there's still that faith is still very central. And so there are these different sort of um, epistemologies, I think at work, which I get into at the end of the book. How, what, what are the ingredients of, of truth? What, 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 are, what are the criteria, the touchstone that makes something true? And, and if you're a person of faith, um, those touchstones are different th than they would be if you were a scientist or if you were a journalist or, or if you were, in, in King's case, a postmodernist, someone who doesn't believe in the idea of a discernible objective reality. And so um, all these questions are at play. And, and, the, and the Harvard Divinity School, I can tell you, at, at the time that Walter Fritz approached, I think he just got lucky. I don't think he knew this going in because it, it certainly wasn't known during any of the initial coverage of the Gospel of Jesus' Wife. But what I discovered was that there was this internal struggle over whether the divinity school should continue to be the, um, the lodestone um, for religious studies or whether a new department of religious studies should be created. And if a new department of religious studies were created on the yard, that would, that would further marginalize the divinity school. It would make it seem even more second tier than it already feels. It would make it seem sort of second rate. And it, it already had, the divinity school at Harvard already had a kind of a status anxiety. So when, when, when Walter Fritz approaches the Divinity School and Karen King with this unbelievable discovery that would, that would put the Divinity School back in the news again in a really powerful way as a place that's doing cutting edge research, of course, no one knew how it would backfire at the time. That, that presents, I believe, a kind of temptation um, and, and, and one that I don't want to give away too much, but I don't think Karen King under other circumstances would have been eager to publish the Gospel of Jesus' life. Yeah. But I don't want to give away too much. It's a good, no. it's a really good question. <laughs> that's, that's what's always interesting to me from reading your book. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Excellent. Someone, Edo Steinberg asked, did the journal not send the manuscript reviewers again after the carbon dating? Um, no, it did. It, there were no peer reviewers. Like, they did not submit it out to, 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 um, to review again. They had a, there was a Brown University Egyptologist named Leo DePoit, um, who from the very start had, from like day one said, this is an embarrassing fake worthy of a Monty Python skit in his memorable words. Um, they asked him to write like a rebuttal um, in the same issue. So there was like kind of a, a like a, a, a rebuttal um, in the same issue of the uh, Harvard Theological Review and HDR state claimed, well, you look, we gave the other side a chance to um, to comment. So we're like, it's balanced now. Although the idea of balance is really sort of fiction because the, the Karen King uh, and her side, if you want to call them sides, had six articles and Leo DePoit had one article. And then after Leo DePoit's rebuttal, Karen King had another four pages calling everything he said complete nonsense. So um, it it wasn't really balanced. Um, and and the, uh, the Harvard Theological Act Review actually used the the explanation of, well, we had we had an opposing view in the same issue, so there's no need to retract. We, we, we presented a forum for both sides. And I think one of the points that my, my, chron my uh, Chronicle of Higher Education article makes is that there no longer are two sides. Karen King herself um, has, has disavowed the papyrus. So why shouldn't future scholars who encounter uh, this issue of Harvard Theological Review um, not be entitled to, to the knowledge that this, the author of the article herself now believes it's a fake, as does every other uh, respected scholar in the field. And that, an that answer is still not, as it, we're still waiting for that answer. There is an interesting question by Angela Keeney. Um, there has been much focus, of course, on King um, as a target for the forger. I'm interested in the role of Bagnall and Loudon uh, um, played in the uh, in early work. How was Bagnall, someone who should have known better, fooled? And why was Loudon, I can't pronounce it, Loudon Dyke, brought in at all? As much as I respect Loudon Dyke, her work frequently jumps to conclusions when it comes to late antique materials. And I see she automatically assigned this fragment to the trash heap. Was Laudyke's promotion to full professor a factor in the in her involvement? So Anne-Marie Leyendyke um, was a uh, one of Karen King's star students at Harvard. She is a she was a study of um, uh, her her PhD thesis was a study of um, fragments of uh, papyri that were private letters um, among early Christians uh, in the provincial uh, Egyptian capital, Oxyrhynchus. Um, and she, her, her, her thesis advisor, um, go, both, both she and Karen King asked Roger Bagnall to help supervise her thesis um, because Karen King is not a papyrologist. Um, and so um, they were all on Karen King, they were, they were all on Anne-Marie Leindyke's um, uh, PhD committee, um, and, which I believe she received in 2005. Um, and uh, after Harvard, uh, Anne-Marie Leindyke was hired at Princeton into the religion department where uh, the famous uh, Gnostic uh, scholar, Elaine Pagels has, has long worked. Um, and, um, and so Karen, when Karen King got the papyrus, um, the first person she, she showed it to was her former student, Anne-Marie Leindyke. Now, Anne-Marie Leindyke that was you know, well-respected, um, and she she had maybe not an unnatural person for to, to give an, a you know a first look to. She's a very junior. She was a very junior scholar at the time. Um, but Karen King uh, showed it to, to Amory Leindyke first, and um, um, and then Amory Leindyke brought it to to Roger Bagnall because Amory Leindyke um, was a participant in these I think once a month uh, informal papyrology uh, meetings that Roger Bagnall hosted his apartment in Manhattan. And she brought the papyrus there and they all kind of discussed it. And it was interesting because all of them had the same reaction. Like Anne-Marie and uh, Roger, um, you know, they looked at this and like, God, this is so bad. Like it's, the, the handwriting is really ugly. It doesn't look like any other script we've ever seen from antiquity. Um, you know, it's just, it's just terrible. And, and you know, the, 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 the grammar seems, seems weird. Um, it, you know, this is, this has got to be a fake. And so there a group of papyrologists who look at this and like, and before she goes public at this meeting, informal meeting at Roger Bagnall's house, 
And they're like, wait a second, no, you know, a, a real forger, if this were a real forger, it would look much better. I mean, no, no self-respecting forger would produce anything that looks this, this fake. And so it was this really weird logic. Like it's, it looks so bad that it has to be real. And if it looks, if it looked really real, it looked really great, then it would be, then it might be fake because any, any forger worth their salt would, would do a better job than this essentially. So they both use that kind of logic. And I do think that they, I mean, were there other motivations? Okay, I mean, Emery Leindijk uh, was a former student of, you know, Karen King's and, you know, professors show their former students things. Um, that's not unusual. But do you have a certain kind of loyalty to um, your, uh, your, your, you know, the person who supervised your thesis? And if they're really excited about something, do you also want to be really excited about it? Um, sure, sure. And, you know, and, and, and Amory was, was coming up for tenure review at that point. I, I, it's possible Karen King would have been consulted uh, about that. I don't think, you know, I asked Anne-Marie, uh, I have to credit her. She was very open with me um, about her own process. And, and unlike some other scholars, she really talked to me about like, we should have been more careful. We should have convened a larger group of people earlier on. It was too insular. We didn't have enough outsiders in the mix. And I think she has done something that, that I think Karen King has not done, which is like, how can we do this better next time? And she was a young scholar and she, I think, really sincerely um, uh, learned something from, from this. Um, and I think she she wants other scholars to learn learn from the episode as well. Um, Roger Bagnall is someone who, and I talk about this in the book, has always wanted papyrologists to to be something other than like the like well, I think like the fingerprint dusters of of, uh, of the ancient his of uh, the world of ancient historians. Like they're not just technicians; they are people who should be active participants in in translating, making sense of, and even working with historians to bring. Um, new history to light. Roger Bagnall is both a historian and a papyrologist. And I think it was very exciting, uh, as it would be, I think, for any papyrologist to be consulted on something um, that would really raise a lot of questions about uh, the early Christianity. And I go into that in greater detail in the book, but um, I think he, you know, he was, um, he also castigates himself. He's like, you know, I, I, if I had seen, I, I had that, that, the, the Gospel of John that, that the same collector had that was, was a forgery. I had an edition of the, the his source material on my desk as I was looking. You know, as I was, I should have made that connection. Um, and I think he also is someone who, um, uh, you know, I think he he also he the other thing that wasn't known until later is that he warned the Harvard Theological Review that I'm not the right person to go to on all of this. I, I do some things really well. I, but Roger Bagnall is a is a papyrologist who specializes in Greek documentary papyri, not in Coptic Christian. And those distinctions matter when you get something like the gospel. Okay. Just as well. Yeah. Angela wanted to ask a question. Uh, I just wanted to reply and say thank you very much. Uh, I, um, I I want to also say that I, I respect, um, well, I don't know uh, King's work very well, but the other two scholars that I mentioned, I do respect them um, quite mm. a lot. So I was um, surprised to find out about their involvement. And it's true, I haven't read the whole book yet because I um, only found out about this last week, but, um, or this um, seminar today. Um, I, I did want to say how I am a, um, I am a, uh, sometimes a paleographer. I, I work with a manuscript text, uh, often Latin and Greek. Um, and so I was extremely shocked by the, the rationale. Um, first, that, um, you know, the, there is a danger in either, in either thing. To expect a perfect text, text from antiquity is, um, is also strange. Like, we expect to see errors all the time. Um, it often gives a sense of authenticity to certain types of text. But then also um, the other, uh, you know, to, to say that something is so bad, it must be real. This type of um, logic is, is totally alien to me. So I think you're, you're absolutely right that it was so insular that they couldn't even see that their own scholarly methods uh, were, were dangerously flawed and had impact not only in their own field, but would radiate out into other fields. I mean, these are very um, strange ways to argue about whether a text is authentic or not, or whether a papyrus is authentic or not. So thank you very much for your work. Thank you for that insight, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I'll just add that this type of argument was also made by the coptologists, and among them, Riel Shisha Levi, an Israeli, very well known coptologist, who looked at the text of, of, of the Gospel of Jesus' life and really said that it, it's, it's so sloppy that it must be uh, 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 authentic. Um, and uh, to Angela, you know, our 19th and, and early 20th century editors at the Monumenta Germania Historica made the same, the same argument for Merovingian Latin. So uh, um, it's not something that is out of the blue. It is, uh, uh, we know and we see that a lot. Um, I think uh, our time is up and I would like to thank uh, Ariel for a fascinating talk and, and um, to invite you to come over to Israel and, and to have more talks with that about this uh, uh, fantastic book and, and, and really an exemplary investigation. And uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And um, David, any words of, of uh, uh, conclusion? I'm waiting for the for the Netflix series uh, <laughs> on the book. Uh, I think we have uh, the, the story doesn't end with the book, and there is uh, uh, much to wait. I think the story is still there, and I, um, it was it is a fascinating uh, story, and you, you know how to present uh, the story uh, very well, Ariel. And Itzhak, I was very impressed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, boss. Thank you very much, uh, all. See you uh, Thursday with uh, uh, gender equality, fairness in gender equality, in, in gender or, or fairness in academia. So thank you, thank you very much, all, and see you soon.